You may be seated. Happy Easter. <laughs> Jesus did a lot of things in his ministry. He taught a lot of things. Uh, he healed a lot of people. He performed miracles. But one of the things that he did uh, as uh, his ministry went on is he began to foretell his death and resurrection. Like he knew what was coming, and he wanted his disciples, his followers, to know what was coming. We just heard from Luke's gospel, and uh, in Luke's gospel, Jesus foretells his death three times. He foretells his resurrection twice. He says, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again. But here's the thing. No one believed him. What? I know, what? <laughs> it's a, no one believed him. And I don't say that because I have some like super secret special insight. I just heard the gospel lesson from Easter morning read. The women went to the tomb. They went with spices. They went with ointments to prepare the body of Jesus for his final burial. They went to the tomb expecting Jesus' body to be there because they had placed it there on Friday afternoon. We don't get a sense that they were going to the tomb going, I don't know, I think he might not be there, I don't know. I think we're carrying all this stuff for nothing. They get there, and the angels say, do you not remember that he told you he was going to die and he was going to rise? And they go, no, we didn't remember. And so they, they say, go to Jerusalem and tell the disciples. And so they go off to Jerusalem. They tell the disciples that the tomb is empty. There are angels that are there, have proclaimed that he is risen. And the disciples do not believe them. They've been told it by Jesus multiple times. The women uh, said it's true, and still uh, Luke says that they thought it was an idle tale. They didn't believe it. Had they believed it, the, the last couple days would have gone differently. Uh, my youngest daughter, Maddie, does not count days. She counts sleeps. So a few weeks ago, we were getting ready to go on vacation for spring break, and she would say, three more sleeps till vacation, two more sleeps, one more sleep, and then it was vacation. If the disciples believed Jesus that he was going to suffer, die, and then rise again, Saturday, Friday, Good Friday, would have still been a tough day. But Friday night, they would have started getting ready, two more sleeps. And then Saturday, they would have been doing, you know, kind of what you and I did uh, yesterday. They would have been, you know, out planting flowers and making brunch plans and making sure we have our pink ties and hats all ready to go. The apostles would have been starting to get their Easter sermons prepared. But they didn't believe him. And so they stayed in the upper room. And even when they were told it by the women again, they didn't believe it. I think there's two basic scenarios here. One is that the followers of Jesus, the men and the women who traveled around with him and who heard him speak and teach for those three years, they either believed everything else except this one thing, or they had a hard time believing any of it including this one thing. And the scriptures are silent on this. They don't tell us which one it is. And so uh, it's sort of up to each of us to think what we think. I tend to think that it's the latter, that they had a hard time believing any of it, including that Jesus was going to die and rise. And again, not because I have some super secret, special insight into the mind of the disciples, I just have insight into how my mind works. And maybe a reasonable insight in how we think. And I think the most charitable way of putting it is that some of us have a hard time believing some of the things 
that Jesus said some of the time. But I think it's probably more accurate that a lot of us have a trouble with a lot of the things that Jesus said a lot of the time. And maybe like the disciples, perhaps, um, you know, it wasn't that they rejected everything outright. It sounds good. When you first hear the things that Jesus say, they sound good. Like, love your neighbor as yourself. His whole ministry was based around the teaching of love, that love is the way, that love is the answer. But, and loving your neighbor as yourself just sounds wonderful and beautiful. It just gives you like goosebumps, right? It's Instagrammable. You can put those words with a soft picture of a meadow behind it. You're going to get tons of likes. It's beautiful until you have to go out and actually love your neighbor. Until you hear Jesus' uh, parable of the Good Samaritan that he told to tell us, to answer the question, who is our neighbor? And the answer is everyone, even the unliked Samaritan. Who's our neighbor? The people we like, the people we don't like, the people who act like us, the people who don't act like us, people who talk like us, and people who don't talk like us. Every person on planet Earth is our neighbor, and we are called to love them. And it's a beautiful sentiment until we have to do it. Do we believe Jesus here, that love is a better way to live in our lives, that love is a better way to live for the whole world? And do we believe it enough, not just to think it sounds good, but to actually do it? One of the other core teachings of Jesus is forgiveness. Over and over again, he says that we are to be people that forgive. Life is real, and uh, every day is not a party. Sometimes people are going to hurt us. People are going to let us down. People are going to betray us. uh, And it's going to hurt, and we're going to get upset, and we're going to get angry. But Jesus constantly says, forgive. One of his disciples challenges him and says, Lord, how many times do we have to forgive? As many as seven times? thinking that sounds pretty good. And honestly, it would be pretty good. If someone hurt you and came to you and said, I'm so sorry, and you said, okay, I forgive you. And then they did it again, and you said, okay, I forgive you. And then they do it again and again and again. By the seventh time, you would feel like a hero of forgiveness, like you deserve to be in one of these stained glass windows. You'd be doing pretty good. But Jesus says, no, not seven times, but I say 70 times seven times. 490 times. And I really believe that Jesus wasn't saying here on the 491st time we were off the hook. (laughs) I think he would assume that we're just not good at counting and that we would just keep forgiving. But, and again, it sounds lovely. It sounds good to say, I'm a forgiving person. But then when we actually get hurt, when we actually get let down, to actually do that time and time again? Do we believe it? Do we believe that forgiveness is a better way of living in our own lives and in the world? And do we believe it enough to actually put it into practice? Forgiveness isn't just something that we do for others. Uh, In Jesus's prayer, known as the Lord's Prayer, he says, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That Forgive us our trespasses, that no matter what we have done, no matter who we are, no matter what we have said, no matter what we have failed to do, that we can be forgiven. And uh, even if the other person that we wronged doesn't forgive us, and at some point that's on them, but even if they don't, God will forgive us. I mean, do we, do we believe that? I don't know why this is the case, but I think it is the case. Sometimes it's just easier to hold on to the feelings of guilt and shame than it is to realize that I'm a person that is worthy of forgiveness. That the things I did yesterday don't define me today, and they certainly don't have to define me tomorrow. Do we believe that? Jesus says, um, do not judge. In fact, he says, do not judge lest you be judged. Do not judge the speck of dust in someone else's eye when you have a plank in your own eye, to which I say, that's no fun. (laughs) It's just fun to judge people. I mean, it it just feels good. 
what use is social media if not to judge other people? I have a spiritual gift. Perhaps you have the spiritual gift. I can tell a judgmental person just by looking at them. But Jesus says, no, do not judge. Live lives that aren't full of judgment, that aren't casting suspicion on other people. Do we believe that? Do we believe that's a better way to live for ourselves and for the whole world? Jesus talks about peace and reconciliation uh, up and over and against uh, retribution. He says, when someone strikes you on the cheek, what do you do? You turn the other cheek. We all know it. But when someone strikes us on the cheek, what do we do? We hit them right back. Someone calls us a name, what do you do? Right back. It's not, again, it's not just easy to do. It just feels good. It feels good to strike back and lash back, at least in the moment. You might not feel so good 10 minutes later or a week later, but it feels good. But Jesus says, no. I mean, our entire civilization, for as long as human history has been recorded, has been a history of retribution. Someone does something to one person or to one tribe or to one city or to one nation or to one uh, segment of civilization, you strike back. The Roman Empire had this uh, doctrine. They called it the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And they truly believed that they would be able to institute world peace because the doctrine said if anyone disturbs the peace, if anyone strikes out against us, we will annihilate them. There will be peace and you will enjoy it. <laughs> and, 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 we have basically followed that doctrine for the last 2,000 years. When someone strikes us, we strike back. And has it worked? I mean, has it brought about world peace? I would say it's never worked. And turning the other cheek never works because we rarely try it. Do we believe it? Do we believe it when Jesus said it? Do we believe it not just at the level of like the United Nations or Congress or the leaders of the world, but do we believe it in our own lives, in our own relationships, in our own homes? Jesus said to have faith. And he said you don't even need to be heroic with faith. You just, a little bit of faith goes a long way. He said that, give that parable of the mustard seed, that you just need faith the size of a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's just this little, teeny, tiny little thing. You just need a little kernel to believe that there is a God, to believe that there is a God who loves you and adores you and is for you and is on your side, a God who loves you so much that he gave the gift of his son who loves you so much that that son gave the gift of his life, who loves us so much that the tomb was empty on the morning of the third day. Can we have that little bit of faith? Can we believe? Do we believe what Jesus has told us? If you are able, would you please stand? And on this day of resurrection, on this day that the church proclaims that love has triumphed over hate and indifference, on this day that we proclaim that the light has finally shattered the darkness, on this day when we say death itself has been defeated, what do we believe? What do we believe? We believe the Father, the Almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, seeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life.